for the most exciting session of the day, the e-commerce session. Um, I think e-commerce has become sort of a very interesting buzzword. And um, you know, it, it, last year, as we, you know, there were a lot of e-commerce companies getting uh, funded and things like that. And the following two guys I'm going to introduce you are sort of, I would say, role models, role models for so many entrepreneurs. Uh, please, we have Bindi from uh, Flipkart and Sandeep. You can sit on this side, Bindi. So I was actually going to call you. But so these guys are role models for uh, a lot of so many entrepreneurs. Um, I don't think there's a day that goes by when I visit a university or when I'm sitting in uh, someone's office and I hear, um, you know, my startup is just going to be like Flipkart, you know, and uh, and and, the, and and or we're going to be like you know Home Shop 18. And I think um, they're almost idolized. You guys, I mean, the company is almost idolized, and you become larger than life in a sense. And and you have sort of a, a responsibility. With that comes a big responsibility, being a role model. So I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion with these guys about uh, all types of topics. And I want to start out, you know, we heard a lot about mobile first. We heard a lot about web first. But it's actually really TV first. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go through this journey of TV, web, and mobile and kind of talk about the different models and things like that. So uh, uh, we, we have about 25 minutes. And we're going to keep it 20 minutes and open up to Q&A for the last five minutes. So thank you very much. OK. Um, how are you guys doing? Very good. Good. Yep. So uh, the question on everyone's mind while we're here, we'll get right, right to it. Uh, there's been a lot of news recently uh, about the retail space and investments. Um, so we're going to get this question out of the way, which is the FDI. Uh, we'll start with you. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what is the FDI? How does it affect your business? And uh, Sandeep, same with you. Yeah, so uh, from our perspective, right, from, from an e-commerce perspective, uh, nothing has really changed from an FDI perspective uh, with the new ruling, right? So it is business as uh, usual, and uh, we continue to track progress there. Um, let me just add to that, uh, whether it's physical or it's virtual retail, uh, Retail demands a lot of investments um, and, and consistent investments. Uh, hence, I think FDI is a very important thing, a very, very critical one if retail has to grow. Uh, so far, it's happened in the physical environment. Hopefully, it will happen in the virtual environment pretty soon as well. Now, you know, about FDI, a lot of people are saying that, you know, you're going you're gonna to start facing a lot of competition. And how are you going to thrive in this competition? Um, is this something that worries you today? Like, who do you consider competition? Do you guys consider each other to be competition? Mm -hmm. So we think, uh, from our perspective, that uh, the internet uh, e-commerce market in India is going to be really, really big. So uh, I think it's very, very early days to talk about how will we deal with competition. I think things are just getting started over the next five to eight years. Things are going to evolve very, very differently than they've done over the last three, four years, right? So you will see a lot of new, uh, different kind of models uh, emerging in the market. And it's going to be really, really uh, dynamic as far as we see. So I think it's a little premature to uh, actually talk about how, how will you deal with competition. You, are you guys, are you guys uh, competitors or yes, collaborators? We are. Yes, we are. But, I, but more than us being competitors, I think both of us are fighting for a share of wallet. So we're competing with each other as we are competing with the neighborhood supermarket or a Kirana or anywhere else where a consumer has um, an option to go and buy. So we're competing with the physical world just the same way we're competing with the virtual world. So I would, yeah, I mean, I would say we are obviously, I mean, in the same business, so there is competition, right? But if you look at it, what we are actually doing is organizing the retail market in India, right? That's what we are doing. And we have just gotten started. So. I think there will be uh, a lot of competition going forward, but it's again early days. But in addition to that, I think um, competition is good. If more people come in, it just helps in growing the market because the market is so big. Otherwise, it will be just left to the two of us or a couple of us to build the market, and that's going to be a very expensive thing for the few of us who are doing it. So, you know, as I was thinking about what to ask you guys, uh, 
I was actually myself confused, are you guys competitors or not? And I thought we'd just clear the air here and just kind of really understand. So I have a couple of questions that I want both of you to ask and just kind of see that. No wonder why you made us sit. <laughs> separately. Yeah, of course. That way you guys can, you know, pounce on me together. Uh, so one is, um, I was trying to figure out, between both of you guys, uh, from a product mix, you guys sell different products. What is the most popular product you sell? And I assume, I have an assumption, but I want to make sure mm -hmm. it's true. So, I mean, the most popular product remains to be books uh, from a sheer number of items perspective. But if you look at uh, from a uh, sales perspective, uh, mobiles and uh, laptops uh, have overtaken books for us over the last six months. Wow, that's amazing. And so, how are you? Are you in the book business? Uh, we are in the book business as well. As a matter of fact, we are the only two. Um, horizontals in the e-commerce space, so we're cutting across literally every category. Uh, when you say e-commerce, are you including your, your TV business? Uh, how, how do you define e-commerce? Uh, you guys are different, right? You're well, yes and no. Um, one thing is at Home Shop 18, I think we're the only ones who are actually standing on two legs. Um, it's not just e-commerce, it's also home shopping and television. Um, categories are more or less the same, but there is a higher throughput. Um, or the propensity to purchase on television is slightly different to what it is on the net. Um, on both cases, digital is a very large category. But on television, we've got home and kitchen, which is very big. Uh, we are now selling more microwave ovens for a couple of big brands than maybe Kronos and Vijay Sales put together. Um, we are also selling more saris than any retailer in the country today. Um, so, on television, uh, the categories are slightly different, but it's more products which are very different. Television are uh, high throughput, uh, you know, uh, a smaller collection, uh, whereas the web is, uh, cuts across a lot of categories and uh, is more about width. I remember uh, you said this quote that uh, we are the largest uh, we sell the most amount of washing machines or something like that in, in the country. Is that what he stories quote? Is that, is that still true? Well, not washing machines, but microwave ovens, right. yes. Um, and now you're in mobile handsets. So, yeah. so you kind of have, I mean, some overlap, sounds like digital, some overlap, but yeah. uh, books and stuff are not. Um, you guys are, I know, entering a lot of uh, uh, things in fashion and clothing, you've launched some things like that. Uh, are you guys selling saris online? Is that a market um, you're going after now? Not yet. Uh, but yeah, so we just started the journey on, on the apparel side last week itself, right? So again, very, very early days for us there. So, uh, you know, one thing this product is there's been a lot of uh, companies and a lot of rumors, not about you guys in particular, but other companies who've been selling a lot of counterfeit items. And I'm sure you've heard of these rumors. And we don't need to name companies or anything like that. That's not really the point. The point is that uh, when stories like this come out, whether they're true or not true, the consumer begins to lose trust. How, how does that affect your business? Have you had people, after hearing these stories, of saying, you know, this stuff is knuckly or this is not mm -hmm. real? And how do you deal with that? How do, you build, how do you build that trust when the whole industry itself starts losing it? So fortunately for Flipkart, so we've been able to build a very, very strong brand in the consumer's mind and which consumers trust a lot. And the other fortunate thing is that we're not into categories where, I mean, these kind of counterfeit products can be sold. Uh, and I, I personally have not come across issues where customers have had uh, problems trusting products that we, uh, we sell. But to your point, I think uh, these kind of stories, whether true or not, uh, they definitely don't have uh, the e-commerce sector. I mean, it's, it uh, creates a bad name for the sector itself and makes it harder, you know, to build, build trust. This is all about building trust and it just makes it harder. And I think in addition, um, uh, at Home Shop 18, and I, I can speak for Flipkart as well, uh, what we're really selling are brands. So every brand comes with a guarantee. Uh, in, in addition to that, there are... Uh, but this is what the other guys were doing. They were selling brands too and they would, you know, the consumer didn't know. I have a friend who bought something. Uh, he bought a polo t-shirt and and he was like, this is fake. And I don't know if it was fake or not fake, but the fact that he questioned the authenticity of the product, even though it's branded, is what, what I'm saying. Well, um, listen, 
difficult to vouch for people who are doing that and, and more so, and I can speak on behalf of television, I think we've had the biggest issue uh, building the home shopping business because of the legacy of Sana Belts and Rudraksh and uh, uh, magic products which have been sold for the last 10-15 years and they still are getting sold. It's, it's a stuff like that which actually takes the credibility away from somebody like us who's actually trying to sell a genuine product. Um, in addition to brands, what we also provide is a 30-day no questions asked money back guarantee. Uh, that guarantee is there uh, primarily uh, for consumers to grow in confidence uh, with us and we give cash on delivery. Uh, which also is about credibility. So there are a lot of things that I think uh, we're all doing fundamentally to build, build trust and credibility for this domain. So, you know, it's uh, interesting. That was actually my next question that, you know, TV sales are associated with a lot of the, the products that you mentioned. And it is a big business, which is why it keeps going. Uh, do you guys uh, carry those kind of products or have you thought about carrying those kind of products and why have you elected if not to? Uh, well, the idea was to build a credible, trustworthy, alternative distribution platform uh, and a retail format. And I don't think you can do that by selling fakes or selling magic. Uh, most of the tele-shopping guys, and I, I'd like to make a differentiation here, there is a difference between the tele-shopping guys and a home shopping company. Tele-shopping is uh, about those graveyard shifts on television, midnight, early morning, these are traders who've got stock and they liquidate it uh, on television. Home shopping is a 24-hour dedicated television channel. It's, it's an alternative distribution platform for any brand to distribute its products anywhere in the country. Uh, and all we do is utilize the reach of television to get those products distributed. And that's what we do. So the question of selling fakes, the question of selling spurious products, or the question of selling magic does not exist. Okay. Um, Vinny, have you thought about opening a television station? Uh, so products? <laughs> I think you're pretty busy building the web business and we don't know, know nothing about building a TV business. <laughs> Not anytime <laughs> soon. Have you thought about yeah, so. like carrying Flipkart products on your, tel on your station? Well, the moment they become a private label, maybe yes. Yeah. So, um, well, that could be a big announcement right here. Yeah. But the good news is there are a lot of people who can get into e-commerce because it's pretty easy to get in, tough to get out. But it's very difficult to build a television business, and I guess that's the reason why there aren't too many people there. Well, you know, th that's that's another uh, thing that's been happening because you guys have been so successful. Um, you know, people have been saying, "I'm going to build the next flip card uh, in this category," or you know, "I'm going to specialize in this." And I'm sure you've heard all these things before. And with the amount of funding that you guys both have gotten, people are also the expectations are so you know out of this world. Um, I wanted to ask you some questions about the funding. There's, there's a lot of rumors, so I wanted hopefully you can bring them to rest. The last round, apparently, we've heard rumors that it was a, a billion dollar valuation, and some people said it's a down round. So here's your chance to kind of comment in public uh, about all the rumors. Well, we don't really comment on any, any private funding plans. And we're asking on a, not on, not on future. We're asking uh, even even on, on, uh, on previous uh, fundraiser, so I uh, won't be able to answer that. You wanna, okay. Yeah. So you're not going to answer. Is it an up round, down round, nothing? How does it matter? It provides entrepreneurs. It's a huge business, right? I, I, I understand. But and Flipkart remains to be a big brand, right? We are still getting more customers. I think it's just, you know, what happens is uh, for you guys, it, and it, it's a blessing and a curse because you're so idolized. People assume you, that whatever you do, they have to follow the same path. Because you're, you're, you're a trailblazer, right? And when you're a trailblazer, it's, you sort of put on this pedestal. And, and people are uh, people Absolutely. Ask. I mean, I hear what you're saying. But I think entrepreneurs should realize that this is a long journey. I mean, it's not like you start a company and two, three years you build it into a $100 million business and you uh, sell it off, right? Uh, that is not what we are trying to do, at least. We are trying to build a hugely successful, very big company here, right? And uh, that is that, that remains the focus. And if that changes, that is uh, that is when I think we'll have problems. I think we're well on our way. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, sort of view the end state of funding. Yeah. When I get funding, I've won the game. I think it's, I mean, funding is a milestone, even I IPO is a milestone, right? When you're building a large business, even IPO is just a se stepping stone. I mean, it's not the end game. 
So that, that's that's the next question. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna assume because you didn't deny or or you know deny the rumors that let's just say it was a billion dollar valuation just for sake of discussion whether it's one or two or zero or whatever, whatever the valuation was. Um, you know the the questions everyone uh, on everyone's mind is that if the valuation is so high. Uh, how do you IPO? I mean, this is already so high. Uh, and same with you, both of you guys. What is what is the plan for an exit? And does it matter? And the reason is the other rumor that's been going around is that the founders have liquidated, mm -hmm. so the founders don't have incentive anymore. This is the rumor. So this is your chance to kind of speak. And they say the founders' stakes are so low, it doesn't really matter. They don't care. Yeah, if, I mean, if the founders had liquidated, I wouldn't be here, right, answering questions. I mean, I would be, you know, at a beach somewhere, <laughs> right, enjoying uh, the sun. So uh, that's definitely not true. So I can at least lay that to rest. And uh, hey, let me just add to that. Um, you know, this business is not about you don't build an exit uh, business to uh, have an exit in mind. Okay, you build a business because you want to build a business. You talk about exit from a financial investor point of but view. But as soon as you get an investor, well, their goals may be different than yours. Their right? goals would be to e exit out of their investment. That Perfect. doesn't necessarily right. mean that the entrepreneur, the founder, or the team that is building the business needs to exit out of that. The objectives are different. You have That's the reason why you build a company with a portfolio of a mixture of strategic and financial investors. Because you have to have a long-term perspective, especially in virtual retail, because these businesses can't be built in a hurry. And when they have to be built in the right manner, they're going to consistently require capital year in, year out for maybe the next eight, 10 years, or could be even longer. Uh, and to add to that, right, uh, so what So what we're building is the retail infrastructure of the country, right? And if that is not I mean, if a billion dollars is too high, I mean, it's not uh, valued at a billion dollars or so two so or it is five, five, I mean, is it, is it then there's, a, there's an issue, right? Oh. <laughs> I don't know what this means. I think it means uh, we're out of time, Fire, so you're, you're lucky. We can't ask you too many more questions. But uh, we're opening a Q&A for the audience. Uh, while we're opening Q&A, uh, I have one last question while the audience gets ready, whatever questions you have. is. Uh, uh, the logistics, I have a question about the logistics business for both of you guys. Um, the stories are that, you know, Flipkart's built their own logistics business and that's sort of what's being funded and, you know, we don't need to get into those structures. And how are you guys managing this logistics? Are you guys building your own logistics? Um, and are you building it because um, there's not good enough alternatives or you view it as a competitive advantage or you're not building logistics? So uh, we are taking a hybrid approach as, as of now I and mean, we are working with the existing logistic guys and also uh, built up logistics in a uh, few cities and the idea is basically customer sat satisfaction I mean that is where where it comes from um, no different to what Flipkart is doing uh, uh, see all, all, all I want to focus and, and talk about here is this this industry is new the consumer is also not mature enough right now, nor are the entrepreneurs, honestly. So we are all trying to figure out the best model to make this happen. Logistics and delivery is the biggest issue, biggest problem, biggest long-term investment if this business has to be built. And it's true because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I might say India is a large country, but it's not one country when it comes to delivering products from one state to the other. Moving products is a nightmare. Uh, we've built um, a, a mechanism to deliver products in about 3,000 cities across the country. We've built, um, uh, and it's also a hybrid, and I must, I must uh, uh, give credit to Flipkart, because initially when we started in 2007, it was completely outsourced. But looking at the success of the way these guys built it, uh, we started investing in building our own delivery network, at least in the top 30, 40 cities, and which is what we today have. But even more importantly, uh, it's not just about delivery. India is also a cash trading economy. So we built uh, a footprint of cash collection in about 1,300 cities, uh, which is, uh, in my mind, one of the biggest reasons why we've been able to build the business to whatever it is today. 
So, Nikhil, please go uh, on. So, I had a question about the policy change that's taken place. Are your businesses illegal right now? Louder, louder. Okay. Uh, I had a question about the policy changes that have taken place uh, recently. Are your businesses, online businesses, technically illegal right now? And uh, if not, how are they legal? Okay, let me let me just, let me just, uh, let me just um, you and I have to have a little chat outside, but uh, uh, that's the elephant in the room right here, that question is the elephant in the room. At HomeShop 18, uh, um, I can speak for ourselves, we are maybe the only one company that has uh, an FDI approval. Um, um, reason for that, we started with a television channel. And in the country, you cannot launch a television channel uh, without uh, a plethora of... Uh, but you have an e-commerce business as, as well. well. As well. Uh, the structures are made in a manner which comply with every legality uh, in the country. Uh, ensuring that everything is is clean uh, and, and legally compliant. And uh, Nikhil, to add to that, the policy has changed for the offline retailers, right? So th there's no change in e-commerce, the policy for e-commerce. So how is it legal is what I'm asking. What is the structure that is legal? As Sandeep mentioned, the structures... Well, me, can I ask you a question? Um, uh, before the FDI thing happened, how is Walmart legal? I don't understand the questions. That's why I'm asking the answer. That's why I'm asking the answer. Retail, B2B, B2C has certain legal issues, uh, certain legal requirements, and for both there are compliance issues. Uh, in certain cases, as a local, as a foreign company, you can't invoice to a customer, uh, but as a local company, you can, right? Uh, so the structures that have been created uh, um, at Home Shop 18, and I'm sure um, Billy can add at Flipkart are all compliant. Uh, right, so there's this. a wholesale company which sells to the front-end retail company and that's typically the structure but the wholesale company is has primarily one client and according to the policy from what I understand and you can correct me if I'm wrong you can't get more you can't sell more than 25 percent uh, to the front-end to a single front-end retail company or a group company. So how, how have you worked around that system and is this therefore is it legal right now? Two things. Uh, one, it's absolutely legal. Um, second, uh, the structure will have to be discussed. Maybe this is not a forum because the structure will require uh, a fair amount of understanding and detailed discussion. I can't really tell you that you know this is the company which is the wholesaler, this is the company that retails, uh, and so on and so forth. But you've got to understand uh, that you can't be in business if you're not a legal entity. Uh, the laws of FDI have so far been changed for physical retail. That's all that's happened. That doesn't mean that before this law, everyone who has been in business was illegal. Just because the laws got tweaked right now, uh, a month back, uh, it does not mean that a month prior, every retail business in the country, physical or virtual, was doing illegal business. Is that a question or an answer? I'm giving an answer. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. We have another question in the back. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Vineet and my question is for Sandeep. Uh, as you said uh, in the discussion that uh, your business currently lies on two legs. Uh, one is uh, e-commerce on web and the other one is on TV. But where do you see the future uh, going towards? Is it like both the things or eventually uh, it will move to e-commerce and TV will fade away? Yeah, this TV never fades away. Uh, it's taken a serious effort building it. But internet, uh, if you see the way it's panned out all over the world, internet is very convenient, is far more intrusive. Uh, uh, the pace at which internet is growing, uh, I think internet in terms of connectivity and connections would outreach, outnumber television. Yeah. Uh, but then there is also mobile. Are, are, you, are you doing more uh, revenue on television today or e-commerce? At the moment, uh, television we have uh, uh, literally twice as much uh, revenue than our internet business. Our internet business is also relatively small. It's only 18 months old. Um, we do about two and a half, three crores a day on TV and about half of that on the internet. Mm. And considering the cost of TV also, the broadcasting cost and also 
That's why I asked, like is future e-commerce and not TV? No, future would be both. India is the only country, and I'll just take a second out here. Uh, if you see the way evolution of retail has happened anywhere else in the world, take US, uh, you had the small mom and pops in the 50s, then you had a Walmart, a large format in the 70s, then a QVC and HSN, the television shopping happened in the 80s, and an Amazon got built in 2000. It's taken five decades. Yep. In India, we've got a Walmart, a QVC, an Amazon, everything that we built in the same year. Okay? So we've sort of collapsed the entire uh, evolution. Uh, I personally think both television and internet and tomorrow even mobile commerce, all three will grow uh, and the headroom of growth is um, huge, huge. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious to know if you see different patterns for shopping between urban and rural India. Is it very different? Is it the same? So, uh, can you actually, while you answer this question, in terms of uh, a revenue mix, mm -hmm. what percentage comes from urban versus comes from rural would be helpful also, give a little context. So, urban, uh, rural would be hard to uh, quantify. I mean, I think 50% of our business comes from our top 8 to 10 metros, and rest of the 50% comes from all the tier 2, tier 3 towns, uh, which includes uh, rural. Uh, it depends on how we define it. Um, the shopping behaviors uh, that we see uh, are quite expected. I mean, uh, from the tier two, tier three towns, we see a lot of demand for even basic products like uh, top-selling books and top uh, and top-selling items in other categories because they are it, uh, even access to them is not available in in those towns uh, easily. Whereas uh, from the metros, the trend is more towards the long tail. <laughs> niche products right? Uh, because they have access to uh, the uh, uh, fast selling items anyway uh, from the uh, uh, offline retail stores. Yeah, I think same everyone, same correct, it's more or less the same. Everyone shops. Same, the same, only difference same mix of 50-50? Same mix. Um, the only difference uh, is on television. Internet is more or less the same. In the metros, uh, we realize that uh, a tel consumer takes a little longer before he actually transact. Okay. Um, and I guess when he sees something on TV, he goes and checks the price for the same product in the neighborhood retail store and realizes it's cheaper with us and comes back in shops. Whereas in a tier 2, tier 3, the decision is much faster. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Hi. This is a question follow up to Shreyas's question. Uh, I don't know, first one basically I've seen a lot, uh, like I'm from a tier 2 city in Rajasthan. I've seen a lot of physical retailer buying, ordering stuff on internet and then rather going on to resell it. Is it something which you have observed in your data and is it something you encourage and how do you look at it? I, have you purchased anything from Flipkart or Home Shop 18? Flipkart, I'm a regular. I love Where, Flipkart. Where oh. yeah. There you go, one. Yeah, so uh, we see that happening on a case-to-case -case basis, uh, not not on a regular basis. Uh, we don't encourage it, obviously, um, because our business is for the consumer, for the end customer. And that's what we focus on. Thank you. Uh, I just want to. Do you have any last any last thoughts you guys want to? Anything you want to share? Uh, so my last question, that I guess, the last part of the day before we close up, is. Uh, we actually stopped question. Is that, uh, you know, uh, first I want to congratulate both of you for your success. I think, you know, what you guys have accomplished is, is, is really amazing. We should give them the big, a big hand. I mean, we really, really are, I mean, really, we put you on a tough spot, but you really are role models and inspirations for, for millions of people uh, in India, and you won't even believe abroad. I was in uh, uh, Afghanistan last year, and it was in a small town called Herat, and they said, oh, we, we want to build like a flip cart. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, uh, and you know, with, like I said, so unfortunately with that uh, amazing success comes a lot of critics, you know, it's very easy. Uh, uh, you know, but what we always say, once you have critics, you're a success. So, <laughs> so uh, but I wanted to know when, you know, when you guys were starting out these companies, both of you, uh, did you envision this type of success that you guys had today? And who did you admire? Who was your role model? Just like today, college students are admiring both of you. Who are your role models? And I just wanted to end on that note. Yep. I mean, at the time we started in 2007, for us, uh, there were two, three clear role models. Uh, one was obviously Amazon. Jeff Bezos was definitely, and we, Sachin and I both worked at Amazon, so uh, he was definitely a role model. A couple of others, I think, uh, Deep from Make My Trip, 
Uh, he had built an internet business in India at a time when uh, nobody else could do it. I think he, he was definitely a big role model for us. And then I guess Zappos uh, was another company we looked up to just because of their customer focus at, uh, in those times. Well, more or less the same except on television. Not really a role model. I was more scared about becoming a tele-shopping company, so I was trying to do everything that had been done till now and just do it completely opposite. Uh, but uh, first 6, 8, 10, 12 months didn't expect us to be successful at all. Um, we were waiting for a shutdown every day because uh, didn't know how to build it. So good things happen by accident. Thank you very much.